thank you everybody for coming to um, our panel, Raising an Active Generation, where we'll talk about um, the importance of keeping kids active and healthy and some of the barriers to doing that. My name is Sean Gregory. Um, I'm, a, I'm a senior sports writer at Time Magazine. Um, the reason I'm here is we just did a big cover story on the youth sports business and how it's kind of grown from a you know, from your kids Little League 20 years ago to now a $15 billion industry, and that has a lot of effects um, health-wise as well, as kids are either um, specializing too early and getting burned out, or, or a lot of kids are priced out of playing sports and not playing at all. And so um, that, that kind of touches on a little bit of everything. So let me just introduce the panel really quick. To my right, Eric Borwinkel. Uh, Eric is the Dean of and the David Lowe Chair of Public Health at the Univers University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Public Health. I did read straight from that on that side. It was, <laughs> it was perfect. Um, to my right, Kathleen Tully, um, who's the Senior Director of Social Responsibility at Reebok and also the Founder and Executive Director of Box. You might be wondering what that is. We'll talk about it. Yep. It's a great program. Um, to my left is Mark Abbott. He is the president and deputy commissioner of, the ma of Major League Soccer. And Mark was the first employee ever at MLS, which started playing in 96, I believe, was the yep. first season. But you were hired in 93? That's right. Yeah. So he helped get that league off the ground. And the league has grown and, and is doing really well. And to my far left, Bruce Lee, um, executive director of the Global Obesity Prevention Center at Johns Hopkins University once thought about going into sports writing and uh, probably wisely decided not to and is doing great work um, and great research on, on, youth, on, on youth sports and keeping kids active. So um, we'll have a free-flowing conversation and at the end we'll do some Q&A um, so everybody can kind of take advantage of these great people up here. Um, Eric, I just want to start with you. just want to define two things. Um, the costs of not remaining active and the benefits um, for kids remaining active. So for you, I'd like to start with the latter. You just point out what's been scientifically proven um, that if kids exercise and play over a certain amount, certain times a week, what benefits do we know will accrue to them? So well, f first, thank you for the question. Thank you for hosting the panel and thank you for all coming. Um, I, I guess, you know, there's many things we could start, you know, ticking them off. Um, there's the obvious health benefits, um, both short-term and long-term. Um, we probably, you know, since we've all come to this, don't need to spend a lot of time on the sort of evils of obesity, um, the evils of childhood obesity in particular. Um, but, but definitely there's the immediate and long-term health benefits. Probably the one that's the most surprising, and we'll pr touch on it, I think, throughout the next uh, 45 minutes or so, are the um, academ academic slash cognitive slash executive function um, benefits. Um, surprisingly, probably to most people, um, those benefits are both um, in, in the short term, sort of pulse, um, immediate from exercise during the school day, um, and long term benefits. Um, the one that is, I'll bring up, um, but, but I'll bring it up with maybe a question mark is the question, and we probably should talk quite a bit about it, whether um, children that exercise grow up to be adults that exercise. And, and, and maybe we should rephrase it not so much as a question, but as a challenge for us, all of us, is what can we do to make sure once we get children, uh, quote, hooked on exercise, what can we do to keep them involved in exercise um, throughout life. Um, and, and, and probably that's not complete, but that's enough to get, there are many uh, benefits. Right. That's enough to get great. us started. And Bruce, you know, you've done some great res research on the economic costs, which mm -hmm. are striking, of if we keep exercising the way we do, what are some of the costs? So I'm gonna try to pull up this slide here. Um, it's the first slide, I believe, from John Hopkins, mm -hmm. Johns Hopkins. Yep. Um, there's some really eye-popping statistics about what will happen if we continue at the rate we are. Yeah, so as, as Eric mentioned, uh, there are many different types of chronic diseases and chronic conditions that are associated with, with weight and, um, and that can be prevented with physical activity. So they include diabetes, they include uh, many different cancers. A recent CDC 
report showed that 40% of all cancers diagnosed in the United States are obesity related. Uh, so we have to think of uh, weight as a risk factor for uh, cancer, as well a major risk factor for cancer. Uh, but diabetes, heart disease, cancer, uh, those are just some of the conditions. You know, there are other conditions such as uh, bone, bone and joint diseases, arthritis, um, mental health conditions and issues. Uh, so what we did was we, we have a simulation model of the entire United States. So all the kids in the entire United States uh, are represented by these virtual people. And these virtual people, uh, just like the computer game SimCity, they, 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 each day they have physical activity, they go around um, and make decisions throughout the day. And each kid in the United States is represented by this virtual person. So what we did is we said, okay, what happens if we have kids being active at the levels today? And currently, if you look at the SFIA recommendations, so that's the Sports Fitness Industry Association recommendations, which is three days a week, 20 minutes, three days a week of vigorous, moderate to vigorous physical activity. So not too hard to reach. Less than a third of kids in the entire United States achieve this level, which is very low. So we want to say, okay, what happens if we increase that percentage to say 50% or 75% or 100%? Or what happens if we increase the percentage of kids who reach the CDC levels, which are higher? So picture it in the screen right here. If you look at the left side, those numbers, those percentages, 50%, 75%, and 100%, that's what happens if you increase the percentage of, of kids that reach that level. And then you can see the, the number of years of life saved you can see the savings in direct medical costs, and you can see, see the savings in lost productivity. So you can see each of those numbers are billions of dollars. So we're not talking about hundreds, thousands, or millions. This is a billion dollar problem, billion dollar issue. Um, and when we say medical costs, you know, these are the costs associated with different types of diseases or different types of problems, ranging from hospitalization to clinic visits to medications. And when we're talking about productivity losses, this is lost salary. So if someone uh, passes away early, or if someone doesn't feel fit enough to work, or even if they're working, they're not working at their 100% level, that's the cost to our society in terms of, you know, to businesses, to individuals in terms of salaries, et cetera. And keep in mind, these are numbers which are replenishing numbers. So every time you have a set of youth, you know, and then they age on to become adults, and you have a new set of youth, then each time you're saving this amount of money potentially by increasing these percentages. So this goes on and on and on. So we're not even talking about you know, 8.1 billion or 13.8 billion a one time as a one time cost savings. This is repeated over and over again every time you have a new set of youth. So the stakes couldn't be higher here. Mm -hmm. And Kathleen, you've done your part um, founding a program, you know, speaking on solutions, trying to get kids more active. So just can you describe how Box started and, and where it is now, what it is? Yeah, so um, Box is a, free physical activity and nutrition program that um, I kind of, so I, my background is I was 20 years in finance, had a cancer diagnosis, so I was gonna be a stay-at-home mom, which I became a stay-at-home mom, and that lasted for about two weeks. And then <laughs> I um, came across the book Spark, written by, written by Dr. John Rady, who's a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and he talks about the profound impact that exercise has on all of us that if we run around and play for 15, for 15 to 20 minutes at 60 to 80 percent of our maximum heart rate, it has the same effect as taking Prozac or Ritalin. And at the time, I had young kids, and I had a whole neighborhood full of kids that were playing on my front lawn before the bus stop. And I thought, well, if the scientific evidence is so strong that these kids would do better in school, they'd be happier, more confident, why are we sending our kids off to school and only allowing them to have PE once a week, which was the case in my hometown of Natick, Massachusetts. And as I started to dig into more research, I found that that was common. Most schools only had PE once a week, and some schools were doing away with recess. So I went to my um, kid's principal, and I said, can we start a before-school physical activity program if I get a bunch of parents involved? And um, I was told no, which I always take a no as a yes. And so I went to the superintendent and asked the superintendent, um, for his blessing, and he had just read the book Spark, which worked well for me. Um, and he said, yes, I love the idea. So I sent an email out to all the parents and said, if you want to drop your kids off an hour before school, 
evidence shows they'll be happier and healthier. So, so of course, I had 80 kids sign up because it was free daycare. And um, I had no idea what, what I was doing, <laughs> except for I had a whistle around my neck and knew how to run relay races. So um, myself and a few other moms and dads showed up. And these kids, within a few weeks, the parents and teachers were giving us this feedback about how these kids were happier in school. They were more focused. Kids were excited to come to school early. Um, and so what I call word of mom started to spread. And other communities started to reach out to me for a copy of the curriculum. And that's kind of when I had my aha moment that um, you know, maybe we should form a solution here that both parents and community members can bring a solution to schools because I know there's not going to be a solution anytime soon. So um, I emailed Dr. Rady, and his email's in his book, and never thought I'd hear from him. And I said, I was really inspired by your book, and I've started this program. Um, would you be willing to help me? And he, like 20 minutes later, I get the bing. Sure, I'll be a director. Let's do it. <laughs> I don't know. Now I'm in really in trouble. I have to do it. <laughs> so um, then I approached a couple local businesses asking for some T-shirts or trinkets. I approached Reebok, who at the time was in Canton, Massachusetts. And um, I had a, a Friday afternoon 10-minute meeting with the CEO. And he said, I'll give you 10 minutes. And I had a little flip phone with a video. And I showed him the video. And two and a half hours later, we were still sitting there. And he said, you know, we believe that the sporting goods industry has failed as a whole, that we've created a, a culture of spectators, and we need to reverse that and create a culture of participants, no better way than to start with youth. So we would like you to come in-house and be part of our foundation and give more kids access to fitness. And I said no at first because I didn't. I thought it was a branding opportunity. I thought it, they were using yeah. it as a branding um, I also didn't want to go back to the corporate world, but you know, he convinced me it was not for branding. He right. was genuine. And so we went in house, and that was um, seven years ago, and now we're in 2,500 schools in four different countries. Um, and it's mostly led by parent volunteers. Um, in the inner city areas where I cannot get the parent volunteers, we get funding. Allison sitting in the front row there, from the from originally from the Boston Foundation, but now with Governor Baker's office, she was one of the first people who believed in our mission and funded us. Um, so she helped fund the Boston Public Schools. So now we're in 60 of the Boston Public Schools, um, and we provide a stipend for teachers to run a before or during school program, sometimes after school now. And it's a 45-minute curriculum, ends with a nutrition bit, teaches a skill of the week, we have, um, I can talk the whole 44 minutes, so better be careful. <laughs> um, we, um, we have partnered with Harvard School of Public Health and Mass General Hospital, who's doing long-term studies on the social, emotional, cognitive effects. We have found that executive functioning, working memory, um, in incredible difference in these kids. Um, and you know, I'm gonna, I could go on and on, well, so you I'll, need I'll to give interrupt one me. <laughs> and so that, so it's, it's great. It's just it proves though you that grassroots movement is really right. necessary in the solution to getting kids active. I mean, you look at the Common Core curriculum; it started out of grassroots, and you know I don't think it's going to be one-stop solution. I think it's going to be a multi-sectoral solution. It's going to need the government. It's going to need private sector. It's going to need parents. But you know we ha we have to make a difference. And so you go from the grassroots over to you know the sports league. So you know. Government actors, grassroots actors, corporate actors, um, and you know a lot of people pointed to what can the sports leagues do to help uh, give uh, more accessibility, more sports accessibility to kids. Um, what, is, what has MLS been up to in that space? So I really break it down into two broad areas. I think most relevant for today is how do you scale and reach the most children on a recreational basis just to get them to engage in any type of physical activity in our case participating in our sport. And one of the beautiful things about soccer is it's relatively inexpensive. It takes a ball, some sort of field or surface of some time, some sort of goals, and, and you can play. And so a lot of our focus is being trying to able to provide facilities for children to play in areas where they might not otherwise have access to those facilities and coaching uh, opportunities so that they can uh, play in some sort of structured environment. So a lot of what our industry has been doing is building what we call mini pitches, which are small uh, surfaces within urban areas, usually the size of a tennis court, that cost about sixty to one hundred thousand um, dollars, and provide those uh, as places where people can, can just go and play, and that's had great success. And you can reach in a city ten or fifteen thousand people by doing something like that. 
Our team in New York has partnered with the city and with the U.S. Soccer Foundation to build 50 of them in the city of New York, and we think that that's a great opportunity to reach uh, and provide opportunity for young children. Uh, the U.S. Soccer Federation, in order to help make that as productive as possible, has a way of providing coaching education. And in the last two years, have educated over 100,000 new coaches, so that helps with participation. On the other end of the scale is elite uh, soccer, and soccer really where you have athletes who have the opportunity to go to college and play professionally. That's very small and isn't on a scale that impacts the types of things that Bruce is talking about. But it's important to note that that's mostly free. Uh, at the very top end of the uh, development scale, uh, development system, no one's charged to participate in that. And in fact, the U.S. Soccer Federation and we uh, have free services to do as much scouting as we can. You know, last year we scouted over 10,000 children, the U.S. Soccer Federation did. And uh, if, if you have the skill and ability, uh, economics is not going to be an impediment to being a participant in those really elite programs. Right. But, you know, as we talk about... Um, you know, the pay to play um, youth sports industry that's out there. I mean, travel soccer, you know, you do, you do reporting on this and it comes up over and over again. Um, you know, there are a lot of teams out there that charge a lot of money. You don't know what kind of coaching you're getting. There's a travel soccer system in the U.S. Um, is that beneficial both for getting kids playing and for developing good players? So it's really not necessarily tied to elite player development. Okay. Uh, it's a wonderful, uh, all of uh, many people here's kids participated in that. It's a wonderful experience in and of itself. But at the very top for development purposes, it's a different culture. And a lot of youth soccer clubs participate in that. But there was a study that the U.S. Soccer Federation did 10 years ago that showed that a purely focused program on winning and what's going to happen the next week is not actually positive for development to be a great soccer player let alone what it may do for you overall in terms of your development as a person. And so the very elite programs are focused on skill development and training and have less competitive games actually than what you might think of in the travel soccer that we all participated in. So I don't look at it as um, uh, an impediment to development because I think development is taking place in a different context at this point. You know, when I was doing the research on this, on this story, um, a, a few professors and academics made the point that if, if soccer was more accessible, we'd be a better national team. So I, I hate to ask, we're coming off a, a time where sure. the U.S. did not qualify for the World Cup. I read about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how much is the men's team? Men's sorry, team. the men's team. Let's be specific. You're absolutely correct. The, the men's team. Very yes, well. thank you. Um, um, is there any is there any connection between the travel soccer industry, the way youth soccer um, on the men's side, boys' side, um, operates in the U.S. and the, the shortcomings that we've had recently on the national stage? You know, I think that would be a stretch to draw that connection. I think that there are a variety of reasons we didn't qualify for the World Cup, but it wasn't because we didn't have better players on the field than some of the teams that we played against. But that being said, our continued growth as a nation on the men's side is dependent on finding the very best athletes and have them participate in the very best training programs. And so it's incumbent upon us as a league, uh, the federation as the governing body, to have programs in place where economics is not an obstacle to that. And I believe we've made a lot of headway in that area. So broadening out a little bit more, um, open to the, to the floor, and we've touched on some of this, but maybe what are some of the biggest barriers to getting kids active that maybe we haven't touched on? I mean, what are the challenges um, that we have to overcome um, to get kids playing and, and reducing the numbers that we've seen as far as costs? In, in my opinion, the number one place we fail is we don't provide enough access to fitness um, and physical activity in schools now. So kids don't learn to love just being fit. And fit is, fit is the sport of everybody, right? If you're fit, then you, know, you can participate in any sport. But you know, until we get physical activity and fitness back into schools every day, just like math and science in schools are held accountable, um, I think that we're going to be in a very difficult position because sport now has become so um, exclusive. And by the time you know, kids get out of school, they, they don't have a passion for sport or fitness because they haven't had exposure to it. If you don't mind, I'll go through a few yeah, slides. Please. Can you queue up slide two, please? And then I'll walk through them. <laughs> so 
let me step back for a minute because the word prevention has been used many times in this meeting. Uh, that I think it's extremely important that if we're going to be serious about prevention in the United States, we primarily focus our attention on children. You know, by the time the physician tells me at age 45 that I've been diagnosed for hypertension, that I need to totally change my diet, I don't want to give the message that it's too late. However, it's a little too late. <laughs> um, it, it's important that we, we change our mindset about prevention and, and, and move, move the clock up three or four decades. And, and, and so I'm a bit of a, a zealot about the role of schools. And in 2013-14, um, the Institute of Medicine commissioned uh, a, a group as they often do on, on physical activity within the schools. It was chaired by Bill Cole, who's part of our Dell Center for Healthy Living in Austin, Texas. And, and all this, this, this slide will do is just walk through their recommendations, which on, on the one hand, are, they're very practical. On the other hand, I think they really give us a, a roadmap of, of what we can do as a nation to sort of move this agenda forward. Um, the first was active transport. Um, if, if you were here the first night, there were some slides that were just sort of w walking through. There were some statistics on this topic, and I won't go through the numbers because I don't remember them, but just a few decades ago, the majority of children either walked or biked to school, the majority. Today, it's a vast minority. I believe the number was 16%, if I recall. So one thing we can do as a community is to start to think about mechanisms to promote walking and biking to school, whether it's neighborhood points that the kids gather and then they'll have an escort uh, to bring them to school safety, safely, whether they're bike lanes, we could go on and on, but I think this is an extremely important component. Um, I'm always amused in my own neighborhood of the number of people who drive to the Y only to get on the treadmill and get back in the car and drive <laughs> home to shower. And I, I actually have a slide when I talk on this topic of a very elite health club in Tokyo. It's on about maybe the second floor. The people that take the escalator up to go into the, um, into the exercise room. The other is PE class. Um, probably most of us in this room when we went to school, whether we, we, some of us probably hated it, but we all took some sort of, of PE class. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's about 50% of kids get zero PE during a typical week. Um, and we can talk about the reasons for that, but it's important that we reinitiate uh, physical education with, within the school curriculum. Another point is um, intra and extramural sports. The, the committee recommendation, by the way, is a promotion of after school programs and a tip of the hat to box. Um, that's my uh, font mm -hmm. there of before and after school programs. I think it's extremely important that we get kids active. Um, there, there's a lot of pressures on everyone during the school day, um, but, but there are times before and after school that we can think about them. You probably can't read the little um, uh, symbols down below, but it's important that those, those programs are offered to the children either free or at very, very low cost. Another point is um, classroom activity time. Um, it's surprising what can be gained, not just from young children, by the way, but across the board, by just getting up, getting up and having um, activities um, throughout the school day and good old fashioned recess. Recess in most schools today, except for the very youngest, it's almost a dying art for a variety of reasons. So bringing back, and it's not just young people, or not just young, you know, primary school, it's throughout the school day, bringing back some form of recess or physical activity or get up and get out um, um, during the school day. Can, can I interrupt you there? Yes, you just for a of second. course. So has anybody been following Florida Recess Moms? No. So they're an amazing group of women who actually passed, had a bill passed last year to mandate recess throughout Florida schools, but now, just yesterday, I think, the Florida School Board came out and said, okay, now that we have mandatory recess, we are going to, on the docket for the next vote, is to take away PE. Mm -hmm. oh. 
The mandatory requirement. So now that they are getting recessed, they're saying, okay, that's fine, then let's get rid of PE. And is there challenges to this? I mean, it makes sense, right? Get up in class and, and recess, but the teachers are paid for test scores, right? They, <laughs> academic performance. So, so let there's me only a limited amount of time in the day. How do you get over that? Exactly. So let me go through. So these, what I've done is just reshuffle. There's nothing new except for the, the red font there. You know, what are, um, and these are mine, by the way, so these sh should be labeled as an editorial. Um, <laughs> What are the barriers of accomplishing? Because if you look at these individually, it, it's not quote unquote rocket science, right? Um, the first is I, I, I label them as competing policies. Uh, first is standardized testing. Um, but again, I think going back to your original question, what does the science say? The science actually says that kids that are active, um, whether it's recess, whether it's PA, PE, before, after school programs, organized sports, those kids actually have better test scores, better test scores. So they're, they're, it's, a, it's a myth to think by keeping the kids in the classroom, sacrificing physical education in a, defined very broadly, that somehow they're gonna test better. Um, surprisingly and very disappointingly, you hear a lot, there's a legal liability. Um, you may have mm -hmm. heard it in the early days of Box, yeah. um, particularly when the moms were, were there and they weren't, quote, certified teachers, et cetera. Um, there's a legal liability on the school system. Um, and, and so that's a competing policy that needs to be addressed. The other is funding, but here in this case, and this does come from the IOM report, it's not just funding for playground equipment or what have you, it's funding for qualified teachers or qualified professionals that can actually work with the kids in these programs. And this is not an easy one. You know, when, and this is a, a, you know, when the school system can no longer hire math teachers, it's a very difficult sell to now ask them to hire, quote, PE teachers. Um, so it's something I think we as a society um, need to, to just address you know, much more. You know, it's, it's a cliche, but you know, we're, we're paying many of these elite athletes millions and millions of dollars. We need to be paying um, our teachers much better and, be, and, and honoring the profession uh, of teaching much more. And, and Bruce, it, it, it kind of transitions well into what we were talking about um, on the phone uh, late last week as a group. The way of thinking about the inactivity problem, it's not necessarily people think, oh, so and so's lazy. It's yeah. you know, it's an individual choice as a kid, exactly. or it's the parents' fault yeah. um, mm -hmm. that that kid's not active. But you were talking about it would be useful for us to think about this as a systemic issue. Maybe yeah. you can just explain that a little bit. Yeah. So this is more of a systems problem, and I think Eric and Kathleen and, and Mark all alluded to this. That there are real systems barriers. It's not like individual kids or or even their parents choosing to have. Um, their child more active or less active. Um, so some of these barriers such as you know, lack of equipment, uh, lack of coaching, lack of time, lack of recreation facilities, lack of access, uh, lack of access is a big problem. There are different populations, whether, you know, uh, 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 whether it's a gender issue or a racial issue or uh, economic status issue that don't have access to a lot of these uh, playing fields or equipment or teaching or being mentored or even bring, um, coming up in a culture in which they play soccer. You know, you look at some of the major um, powers in soccer throughout the world and they grow up playing soccer. That's what they know, that's what they think. So if we continue to view this as just an individual issue or a luxury, uh, you know, sometimes people view, oh, that's just for fun. You know, sports is entertainment, it's a luxury. But instead say, this is, this is a real public health issue. This is a real health issue that we need to dedicate more energy and time into and then solve some of these larger problems. Like how do we, how do we design the communities in a way where people can get better access to a, a soccer field? You know, how do we uh, structure people's time so they can you know, play, play soccer and actually do it? And, and how can we get people to, to teach them? And it doesn't always have to be formal coaches. You know, it can be, you know, parents can show their kids how to play. You know, it's, uh, there can be playtime in the neighborhood. And Sean, we also talked about the idea of um, play, free instance, play, sports, free play. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's, there are sports leagues and certainly uh, things that people can do, but there's also a time in which you just run around. Yeah. You just burn off energy. Uh, you, you learn how to, ex and you know, when in previous generations that was sort of assumed, right. you would have that time where you just run around and you spend the whole day 
doing something. Yeah. You can't really recount what it is, but you are being active. But now we've sort of segmented. This is the time you do X, Y, and Z, and right. that doesn't quite work. Right. So, mm -hmm. and there's and there's a you know if you look at some research, mm -hmm. um, particularly out of Australia, I don't know it that well, but there's huge athletic benefits if you want to be good at your sport. It helps to just play unorganized, all kinds of different un unorganized sports. Thank exactly. I, I just was going to say the other big problem Tuli face is that the inequality gap is growing. So, mm -hmm. zip code now is your number one predictor of your your health and you know for health and wellness and if you look at a kid that is born in Roxbury Massachusetts versus a kid that's born in Back Bay of Boston there's a 33 year age difference or 33 year life expectancy difference on average i think it's 15 years across the country so um, there's also a huge inequities gap that um, we need to solve for. And I think a lot of that is what you just spoke to, Bruce, like the um, open access and space availability and safety. Mm -hmm. The Sports Fitness Industry Association does some great research on this, that if your household income is 100,000 or more, 41% of those kids play team sports. If it's 25,000 or less, it's 19%. So it cuts it in half. Eric, yeah. you going to? Yeah, Brian, I was going to make a point that um, in a city like Houston, where youth soccer in particular is, is so popular, but pay, for pay youth sports are very popular. It, w particularly within the city, they gobble up the fields. The fields are entirely taken. Hmm. And so those individuals, usually for financial reasons, but not only that, who can't play or don't play on those elite teams, but yet want to play just a pickup game of soccer, right. there are no fields. And, and, the, and, and there's a structure in place, actually, to, quote, kick them off of any fields um, that are present. And, and so we've got to, I think we need, as a society, and I very much liked um, the, the presentation on, you know, what MLS is doing in this area of, op you know, identifying spaces and opening up fields. I think we need to expand those types of opportunities to give people places, safe places for that free time or f safe places for the, the non-pay um, sports. So let's make it, and Mark, let's maybe make this a little more upbeat. We know the problem, we know <laughs> the costs. Um, <laughs> is there some hope? Why, why are you hopeful, if you're hopeful, that um, more people will find religion and realize this is a huge issue and move to enact some of the solutions that we've talked about? Well, I think it's like any problem or social problem that we are trying to solve. If you can show models that are scalable, hopefully that provides some opportunity. So in our particular area, as we talked about, I think we have seen success with being able to provide smaller spaces for people to play. And field usage is a huge problem. And it's not just in our sport, but it's competition between sports. And I think we see this in wealthy towns and we see this in, in less affluent towns. And so I think that cuts across all of society. But as we've seen some success in providing some level of these smaller spaces where people can participate, hopefully we're able to show they work and hopefully we're able to attract additional funding. It's an area at least we've seen that corporations are interested in getting behind. Mm -hmm. We've had great success in seeing really leading consumer brands look at that as a way to be involved, uh, maybe somewhat from a branding perspective, but also from a social responsibility <laughs> yeah. perspective uh, to try and do good. And I think that uh, I don't think it's different than any other problem. If we can find models that work. One of the other interesting things that I've seen a lot of are people who have programs that try and twin sports, in our case soccer, with other, some other social uh, uh, issue that they're working on. So it could be leadership, uh, it could be the arts, and we see a lot of these smaller programs who come in and talk to us about you know, nationwide programs where they're dealing with thousands of kids, but it's not just about the sport, it's the sport and twinning it with some other goal that they have. And I think those are very innovative and uh, hopefully they continue to flourish. Is anyone else hopeful? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know if this is, I, one of the, UNICEF is doing yep. that with Kid Power, where yep. they're feeding, so you track your movement and it unlocks food packets for um, malnourished kids in third world countries, which I think it's a wonderful, yep. innovative approach. Yeah, I think the, um, so the economic story is both, you know, concerning, but it's also very um, uh, encouraging because you're talking about dollars that's on the table right. that basically you, you can save. So, you know, a program like, for instance, Kathleen's program, it shouldn't be viewed as a cost. That's an investment that actually can yield a very positive return on investment. So this is actually creating capital 
creating uh, potential wealth um, and it's a positive investment. And we're really talking about win-win situations. So everyone benefits. If everyone, you know, if there's more people uh, being active, more kids being active and more adults consequently, then you're saving businesses money, you're saving medical costs. You know, we all, we're all talking about healthcare. You know, healthcare is on the news every day, but this is tied to healthcare, you know, right. uh, all of this stuff. So, you know, uh, and, and business and sports businesses uh, benefit, more people are using the equipment, more people are participating in the sports. So, uh, so one example of an initiative is, is Project Play 2020, which is basically, uh, that was um, uh, pulled together uh, uh, by the Aspen Institute. So Tom Ferry is, uh, who, who directs the um, uh, sports uh, activities or efforts of the Aspen Institute was really instrumental in pulling together uh, many different constituents to collaborate and say, okay, we've got to try to fix this, this problem. You know, we have to find ways to encourage more kids to play sports. And what Project Play 2020 is doing is it's, it's going to be setting different milestones and, and, and key indicators and say, okay, we need to achieve these different things. And what's really encouraging are the participants. So you've got like NBC Sports, mm -hmm. Major League Baseball, you've got uh, large businesses like Target, um, Nike, all coming together and recognizing that this is a group problem. And, you know, these are major forces uh, in, in various different types of industries. So when you have people like that recognizing that it's a problem, there's reason for a lot of hope, I think. I, I also have to give Gene a call out here too because he created, Gene in the audience over there, he created an app, who, which um, Charity Miles, which actually pairs businesses with, as you exercise, you're giving back to social causes. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's invest, so it's businesses partnering with your physical activity to give back to social causes. So it is, you know, there's, there's unique, um, wonderful, opportunities out there too. It's a great, great approach. And we've talked about several, oh, okay. I was just gonna tell a story. I remain positive, in fact, I am positive. For the, the other reason is what I've seen, again, in our community is the realization that bored kids get in trouble. Yeah. And communities are motivated by troubled youth. And so, they wouldn't buy fields and make them available to the, the broader community because of physical education, but they're motivated to buy fields and make them available because of this tr lowering, I don't want to say youth crime rate, because it's not crime. It's just keeping, keeping youth um, active, positive, happy was the word used several times. Um, that's been a motivating force, at least in Houston, to buy and make fields available to the broader community. Well, and how about the whole opiate epidemic? I mean, keep them away, from, you know, exercise is prevention for, and opiates, you know, that's probably our number one crisis right now. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the, you know, you can introduce kids, and you know this from personal experience, to exercise um, and fun, but how do you keep them active for life? Right? It's one thing to get them active when they're young. It's, I know it's a big question, but any specific ways or techniques you guys have seen where it seems to work where oh, this is going to be a long-term thing where it becomes an investment and it pays off down the road? One word, fun. Yeah. Make it fun. Thank you. I agree. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make a shout out for soccer because one thing I've seen is soccer actually helps. There's, a, there's great youth soccer. There's good young adult slash college um, sort of rec soccer in a town such as Washington. If you, you know, drive around the, the, the memorial area on the weekends, it's loaded with people playing. Yeah. And so you go back to all you need is really a ball and a makeshift net. Right. Sports like that do keep people active. Right. And I would also say, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, um, that community is huge. You know, like people are looking for, um, they want account, they want a partner, they want community. And we're seeing that in all these, you know, different class pass things that are going on. And, you know, Angie Thurston out of the Harvard School of, um, Harvard Divinity School did this large study on the decline of church population and, but the growing popularity and things like the November Project. And so much of it is because people are seeking, especially with, you know, the, all the electronics we're on, we're so isolated and we have no community and there's so many lonely people out there. So they're looking for community. So if you can make it fun, the soccer is the community, like that's critical. And, and just to, to speak to the fun aspect, pro, um, the Aspen Institute Project Play, they, they did, they've done some surveys and they surveyed a bunch of kids in Detroit 
and about you know how do we make sports more accessible, more fun? And, and one kid wrote in, in a survey response, I'm going to get the wording wrong. It's basically like, you know, playing you know basketball with my friends is, is cool, but it's much more fun when adults aren't around. You know. <laughs> um, and the, the interesting thing about in our sport, I can only speak about our sport, is that it actually is better for development. One of the one of, one of the one of the challenges that we sometimes have in our country, relative again only to our sport, is the phenomenon of overcoaching, and it is a game of individual decision making and reacting to situations. You find them, and you can only learn that by thinking for yourself. Right. And so, what people find fun is actually better from a sporting perspective. Right. And I'm not sure that's always recognized. Right. Anything yeah. else about? Well, the, the sport sampling that we talked about, yeah. where you're not really focusing just on one sport. It's not just targeted laser vision. Uh, because we know that the, the percentage of, of kids who actually make it to, you know, getting a, a two percent high school very, very low, and then making the pros even even lower. So really, and if you talk to, uh, uh, like you said, Mark, uh, many of the star athletes, I think uh, during the Project Play Summit, uh, Harold Reynolds, was, who was a baseball player, was saying that you know he played every sport. So very few sport, star athletes will sit there and say, I just played this sport, you know, from. Day one. But it, go against, yeah. it goes against intuition a little bit, right? Yeah. If I want to become a good basketball player, I should play 12 months a year. Why does, from a scientific point of view, does mm -hmm. multi-sport sampling possibly help down the road for you to become better in your sport of choice down the road? Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's multiple reasons. So one is physically. So each different sport is using a different set of muscles. Right. I mean, there's crossover. You know, certainly there's footwork in different sports, but you're really you know, using a wider range of muscles. And then there's also crossover in terms of skills skill development. So if you uh, learn some you know, footwork in soccer, then that can help on the basketball court and, and uh, other types of areas. So, so one is you're developing these different muscles uh, um, more equally. Two is the injury risk. So again, if you, you know, if you take your hand and you keep moving it in the same direction, you know, keep throwing a baseball, at some point your shoulder's going right. to um, get hurt. So you need to give it some rest. Um, the third is, is mental. So you know, when you're, when you're focusing on one thing, uh, and each of these different sports requires different types of foci. You know, say, say you're a quarterback, you know, you're, you're, you're trained to think a certain way, you look down the field and you think a certain way, but if you're playing something else like soccer or baseball or tennis, it's different. Right. So you're giving your, your, your head or your, um, your, um, your thinking some more rest as well. So you're, you're basically, uh, you know, there's a lot of studies which show that you know, continuous exercise, continuous training, your body's in this mode where it's more of an injury mode, you know, injure, recover, injure, recover. Whereas, you know, if you're actually consistently, you know, taking rests, your body has a chance to heal and to grow and to, to further develop. And one of the best pieces of research that I've come across that backs up the benefits of sports sampling. A few years ago, UCLA surveyed all their athletes, Division One athletes, scholarship, the, the pinnacle of Division One. And 86% of their athletes played two or three sports growing up. Yep. So people specialize and they go crazy exactly, at, yep. at a young age. And the outcome that a lot of people are looking for, it actually works in direct conflict with it. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left, um, 14 minutes left, small room Q&A. Um, let's just talk. <clears throat> I did, I yes. Read, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and it was quite good, but it really described the detriment of these paid coaches to kids' health. One, it, doing one sport doesn't help them to get to the elite that all the parents think they're going to do. Two, they burn out. And when they're adolescents, especially as they hit the high school years, they quit playing. They don't participate because they think if I'm not elite, I can't do it. Um, and they're only learning one sport, so when they get older, there aren't other sports they can Right. And they, no one has the kids' best interest in mind. And the last thing I'll add is it takes away from the community of the school. We've talked a lot about community. And these kids play on the elite teams and not on their school teams, which is where their community is. And so it detracts from that. So how do we get it out of the hands of those folks? Anybody want to tackle that? <laughs> <laughs> I can speak just a little bit about what's happening in the dynamic of soccer. And, and again, it's difficult because we're talking about a relatively li limited number of children who participate at that level. But all of our clubs offer all of those programs for free for the truly elite, 
I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, which yep. I think is true, but they aren't going to get they aren't going to get to those elite programs unless they've had some paid stuff along the way. That's not necessarily true, actually. I, I understand the argument, but yeah. in fact, the U.S. Soccer Federation runs over 500 uh, sessions and centers around the country where anybody who has the talent can come and play for free. And so I'm not saying it's perfect, but there really is a recognition at the highest levels in terms of development that having to pay to be a per part of that system isn't effective from a develop, forget right, it's right. detriment no, to the athlete. It's not great from a development perspective. Right. And so there is that recognition. I think what we're seeing, and it's gonna take some time, is we're seeing the clubs that are not part of that system having to react from a market perspective to it and start to become you know, more economically uh, available. So I, I don't know that there's any one answer to it, but there is a recognition of the issue for sure. And just, yep. so, and I'll stop, but, and I, I agree with that, but like you said, that's the a small elite part, and it's not just the cost, that cost is part of it, but it is forcing these kids to play one sport, you know, and not letting them do lots of sports, not letting them do things that we know are a lot healthy. So the cost is part of it, but that's how they get their salary, but it. But yeah, that, it's a tricky question, and yeah. I, and, and as a parent, I, I, I understand that very, very well, and, this, and the data couldn't be more clear. The question is, for very, very elite athletes, does more of a focus on one sport become necessary? And at some level, it may, right? But that's not the vast majority of children. That, I, I agree with you. It's a very, very small people. And, the, and, and, and I think the mistake that's being made is the application of that principle more broadly. Mm -hmm. Because, let's face it, the more broad uh, population base is not going to be a professional athlete. And they shouldn't be in a system that, that is convincing that they will be. I think that's where the challenge lies. You could actually make an economic argument to, to broaden sports participation. I, th I think a lot of these uh, financial opportunities are short-term, short short-term thinking, saying, okay, you know, if we focus on the star athlete or we focus on the merchandising for the star athlete, that's great. That's going to make some money immediately. But ultimately, you know, you're interested in expanding the base. So say you are a sports league or say you are a sports equipment uh, provider or any, basically anyone involved in those areas. Uh, it's much more profitable to have a lot more people participating, not just for that period of time, but you know, going forward, you know, beyond that. I mean, Sean, for instance, you know, you, you play college basketball, you know, you're, but your career doesn't necessarily stop right then and there. You know, you, you continue to buy basketball shoes, you continue to buy uh, basketballs or join the gym, et cetera. So I think helping different businesses realize that it makes financial sense to do this as well. So, you know, here's the challenge. It's, it's one thing to tell people, this is good for people. This is a good thing to do. And there are a lot of well-meaning people out there. A lot of people running businesses are very well-meaning. They have kids themselves, so they want to do the right thing, but they also have certain expectations that they have to fulfill, especially if they're a public company, et cetera. But if you make a financial argument and you say, look, if you do this, you know, this is gonna help expand your market. These are the people that you're going to uh, bring on board. They're gonna purchase uh, equipment, participate in the sports leagues, et cetera. You show them some of the numbers, some of the return on investment. That changes the dialogue. So if we advance this from a, a thing that's good to have to a thing that we must have, from a health standpoint, from an economic standpoint, and those things, I think we're going to start seeing a shift, uh, and also at the school level too, pointing out, you know, like um, Eric, you were, you were mentioning test scores, things like. If you draw that connection and say, "Hey, look, we're all on the same page. This is something that will help what you think is the bottom line as well," that changes the dialogue. And I also think that that's a um, that's a high income white problem. That's not a. To me, that's like, let those, those crazy parents figure out that, you know, I, sh I shouldn't say that, I'm probably one of them, but, uh, <laughs> um, but to me, the bigger issue is the other 90% of the kids, like just giving them access to any sport. I don't, I, let's spend our time on that 90%, let that one to 10%, I, that's my thought on that. Go ahead, you can speak with other people. So I actually worked at the public hospital in San Francisco General, and our soccer program was at a, uh, failed public school where the kids came from the projects and parents at the school would go into the projects and pick the kids up and help them participate in the soccer and some of them ended up being quite good athletes so I think but it the whole leagues the the rec league goes away 
you know, as the kids get older because only the rich white kids who have the money keep playing. Yeah. There's, you know, schools that are trying to have kids play that aren't from those wealthy groups. There's no place for them to continue playing soccer. So it kind of, I think it's a problem we've created. Yeah. But I don't, but I think it would be much better. It used to be kids from all groups could play in organized sports. And I think it's really hard now. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Right there. Yeah. We'll get yeah, on. I think just a question for Kathleen. What what ages does your uh, Bach program? Is it is it all it's, the way through high school? Or? No, it's pre K through eighth grade. But there's a lot of demand for high school, so we actually are working with some um, different groups right now to create high school because. Yeah, because I am struck by our focus today a lot on organized sports and it played it great. Uh, but I think also that the, the competitiveness turns off so many. We know that there's a lot of limited, you know, um, I've worked with high schools where there's 2,000 students, so you have to be exceptionally great to be on that team. Um, and so it seems to me that there's so many other things. I mean, if we just got kids to walk, I mean, yeah. you just really think yeah. we're, Absolutely. you know? Yeah. It, I mean, it's just that where we are and where we wanna be, that I think well, the opportunities of as much as we can do, but unorganized or organized unorganized if that makes yeah. sense can i interject an editorial here there's been a huge amount of precision health at this meeting and i'm a person i'm a geneticist by training <laughs> for 32 years we all need to exercise more we all need to eat better we all shouldn't smoke so don't think you're somehow hardwired because you know you choose your parents you know, some people think that, you know, if you only went to this meeting, you'd think if you sequenced your DNA, you'd show you whether you should play soccer or baseball. <laughs> it's just not the case. It is the case that there's predisposition. It does change probabilities. I could talk for hours, which I won't, but we all need to live a better lifestyle. It is not a blueprint. It may be a bit of a guidebook. It is not a blueprint. <laughs> Anyone else? Jane. It's probably going to get me in trouble. <laughs> First, I apologize if you already addressed this, but I was session hopping. So um, in thinking about raising an active generation and sport and youth, um, and in thinking about the public health literature that we're seeing these days on head injuries and, um, and uh, concussion, I'm particularly curious, since we have um, soccer folks on the panel, I'm thrilled you're here. Um, I'm curious what you think MLS needs to be doing in terms of modeling good behaviors about concussion, um, because we're seeing rules changing for young kids um, in you know sort of junior kinds of leagues, but we're still seeing pro athletes, name your sport, who are not wearing headgear, who are losing their livelihoods from head injuries. And I'm curious for all of you, but in particular MLS, um, what kind of modeling you think the pros should be doing for kids to make sure that when we are thinking about raising an active generation, we're doing it in ways that are brain smart and head smart? Sure. So, I mean, I think that the most important thing that we can do as a professional league in terms of modeling is to demonstrate that when we are confronted with a potential head injury that could be potentially a concussion, we have a strict protocol for the management of that that everybody can see because it's on television. Uh, and, um, and that's something that we have. And so if there is a suspected concussion, there's a, what's called the on-field scat test that's performed at that time to determine whether there's a possibility of concussion or not. The athlete's immediately removed and only a doctor can put them back in. They cannot be put back into that game, only a doctor can determine when they can play. So we can, you know, walk the walk uh, in terms of what, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Right, so th there's no evidence that headgear would present, prevent concussions. And in fact, if there is evidence, it might enhance it because people feel more invulnerable. And that all of the, most of the evidence indicates 
that concussions in soccer are not the result of heading the ball, the result of perhaps going up and heading the ball and hitting your head against somebody else or your elbow to the head or hitting the goal post. And so the act of heading, uh, particularly for an elite athlete, is not likely to be the re result in a head injury. It's some other contact that happens and headgear is not likely in our sport anyway to protect it. So there's just no evidence that, and we've done a lot of, as an industry, looking at this. So our, our view is that the first thing you need to do is most responsibly manage a head injury when it occurs. Um, and it's, there aren't many rule changes at the professional level, or any for that matter, that you could implement that would limit the number of potential elbows and all that. Those are already violations of the rules and they're punished. Uh, I think also as a professional league, we have an opportunity and an obligation to help educate people. And I think that there has been a much more widespread recognition at all levels of every sport now about the dangers of head injuries and the need to take those uh, seriously. But it's something that we always need to be vigilant about. We have time for one more question. Um, just so I want to circle back to, I think, is it Dr. Lee, something mm -hmm. that you mentioned about the, how do you get the, the economics of getting people to stay with something for a long time? We morphed a lot into youth competitive sports, mm -hmm. and want, I was someone who played high school and college sports. I have t two sophomores in high school. Both are athletes in, on the high school, so I, I'm all for that. But what I love about Kathleen's program, Box, and part of why it was one of the investments I made when I was at the foundation, as well as an organization called Playworks, which is a national organization that I now serve on the New England Advisory Board for, but they're based out of Oakland, is that Box and Playworks teach kids how to play. They teach kids how to have fun and how to move. It's about four square and jump rope and relay races, and it's not competitive sports. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think that what's really important is to figure out how to extend that play, which we tend to think about play right up to elementary school. And then as soon as we hit middle and high school, it becomes, which team are you going to be on? Yeah. And if you actually look, we did this research in Boston, there's an incredible drop off of youth participation in physical activity when it starts becoming about <laughs> sports leagues, mm -hmm. both because of the economics, because people like Kathleen and I lived in well-heeled suburbs, pay for our kids to be in sports, but a lot of folks can't do that. So I think what we need to do to kind of crack the nut to have both the physical impact for young people is how do we extend play yep. into those higher aged kids? And then that also helps with your economic standpoint of then somebody's just about moving and doing something active and being part of an active adult generation because it's always been what they've done. They didn't mm -hmm. just do it to age 11 and then stop. That's the question I'm really curious to hear what the experts think. How do you extend play into something that goes beyond 11 years old. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So part of it is shifting the conversation of what physical activity is. Like you said, you know, and very eloquently, it's becoming viewed as this competitive thing. And uh, you know, we had a, we had a symposium about a year ago where people got up, and and there are people with very negative um, feelings about sports because they viewed it as oh, that was when you know the hazing occurred, or that's when you know I was told that I wasn't good enough to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and and those, are, those are people who are dropping out that could have benefit from sports. If you look at the, the science and the literature, it, it doesn't just benefit um, you know, physical activity, it doesn't just benefit uh, you know, direct health, but it also has leadership benefits, it also has professional benefits. You know, we've seen there's evidence of after you have more girls participating in sports, then they can take a lot of that benefit to you know, the workplace and you know, they, they know leadership and teamwork, et cetera. Same thing with different types of disadvantaged populations. The problem, again, is the part in part the dialogue that it is so focused on competition, so focused on the competitive sports. So if, if you change these things and say, oh, why not have rec leagues or make the teams larger um, you know, in high school? Why do you need to have, you know, why, you know, why is all the focus on just varsity teams? What about JV teams or, or rec leagues and those things like that? You need the high school equivalent of what they have in college. You need the club teams exactly. to yep. take over. In college, very few people play on the varsity team, but yep. they have club teams. Yeah. And everyone can put, they need a high school version of that. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's also potential opportunity as well. I mean, you know, there's some 
pro athletes that didn't make their varsity team the first time around, right? And then you, you, there, there are people who are late bloomers. Um, so again, it, it, the, the laser focus is actually probably hurting you know, all the different constituents within sports and physical activity. So it's looking at the larger picture, doing it as a larger system. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Eric, Kathleen, Mark, and Bruce.